And what Einstein thought, well, of course not. <laughs> that would be spooky action at a distance. The interesting thing is you also have in quantum mechanics, and there's no classical analog to this, things we call entangled states between the two particles. So this is where the magic, as it were, comes in. Um, in fact, the term entanglement, well, the translated in English as entanglement, was introduced by Erwin Schrodinger in, also in 1935. And Schrodinger was writing a paper in, I mean, in response to, in reaction to is better, to the EPR paper that I already told you about. So Schrodinger reads the EPR paper and goes, gee, they really have an interesting point here. And uh, when Schrodinger writes this paper, he actually says in a footnote, he's not quite sure what to call the paper. I think he says maybe it should be called a confession. Because he's just, he, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen have put their finger exactly on a really interesting feature of quantum mechanics. And Schrodinger says here that it, it, when he introduces the term entanglement, he says it's entanglement, not anything else that forces a departure from classical lines of thought, right? It's not the probabilities or, you know, the discreteness or anything like that. What really is taking you away from anything you could do in classical physics is entanglement. And we'll, in particular right now, we're going to just talk about a single entangled state of a pair of particles called the singlet state, and it's written this way. Now, if you can't see that, I'll just go to the next slide because now you can see it, <laughs> okay? So this is just the mathematical representation. What is this thing? Well, this I already told you about. This is the product state. This is the state where Alice's particle is x spin up and Bob's particle is x spin down. So if they both checked in the x direction, for sure, Alice would see up and Bob would see down. This is the state where Alice would for sure see down and Bob would see up, right? Those are just product states. But this is a combination of them. These little one over root twos in the front, you can sort of think, that you, when you square these and add them up, they add up to one. So you can think of kind of weights. Um, it turns out this minus sign is also quite important here. If I change that to a plus sign, some of the phenomena would change, but we won't worry about that. Anyway, you can, you know, an easy way to, to get one of the predictions out of this is to say, well, what if the pair of particles is in this state and both Alice and Bob decide to check in the x direction? What will happen? And what the theory says is, well, I can't make a definite prediction here. There's, if you square this, there's a 50% chance you'll get this outcome, that is, Alice up and Bob down, and a 50% chance you'll get this outcome, that is, where Alice down and Bob up. Okay, so for sure they'll get opposite results, but I, I give you no information about whether it'll be this or this. I could change these numbers, so, oh, 90% of the time it'll be this and 10% of the time it'll be that, but we always use this state where the... the divided between, yes? So that's an entangled state, that's the singlet state. And uh, this is what I just said, that, that, that it, if you just look at this, you say, well, this state, as it were, if I check in the x direction, if they both check in the x direction, it might act like that, it might act like that. And the likelihoods is just the squares of these things, that's what I said. Now, that, so there's a perfect correlation between the outcomes that, that Bob gets and Alice gets in the sense that once Alice sees her outcome, whatever it is, she has no idea what it's going to be, right? She knows they've been prepared in this way. She says, I can't, I don't know what's going to happen to mine. Once I see mine, I know what Bob's is going to do. Bob doesn't even know what Bob's is going to do, right? But now I know what Bob's is going to do. Because those are perfect correlations, from the outcome of one, you can predict with certainty the outcome of the other. That's the key to all this. Now, you can, you can run this with, with less than perfect correlations, but the EPR correlations are perfect. And, well, now I'm just repeating what it says here. Each one, uh, as, as a consequence of seeing their own outcome, can now predict the other one. And so, 
But the singlet state itself, remember, the singlet state itself does not predict specifically what either Alice or Bob will see, right? They say, well, there's a 50-50 shot either way. And now you say, wait, but wait. <laughs> Suppose the wave function is complete. Remember, that was our question. Is the wave function complete? The wave function doesn't predetermine whether you'll get this outcome or this outcome. So the wave function, from the wave function alone, I can't predict what Bob will see. But Alice, when she sees her outcome, she can predict what Bob will see. How, how, can, that, how can that be? I mean, this is essentially, um, the question is, the question now comes up, all right, Bob, he does his experiment. He gets his outcome. He now predicts what Alice will see. Did his doing that experiment in any way at all disturb or change or affect the physical state of Alice's particle? Now remember, Alice and Bob can be as far away from each other as you like. You create this singlet state here. You send the two particles out. They can be 100 billion, billion, billion miles away. Bob does his experiment. Did him doing that experiment in any way alter or change or disturb Alice's particle. And what Einstein thought, well, of course not. <laughs> that would be spooky action at a distance, or that would be what Einstein elsewhere calls telepathy, right? So he, he makes, they, they make the assumption, it's, it's kind of implicit because they think it's so bloody obvious that of course the one experiment doesn't affect or alter the physical state of the other particle. And they make this clear in something that's called the EPR criterion of reality, which is in the paper, and they introduce this criterion. If, without in any way disturbing a system, we can predict with certainty, that is with probability equal to unity, the physical value of a quantity, then there exists an element of reality corresponding to that quantity, right? If Bob, by doing his experiment, and in no way affecting Alice's particle, can predict what her particle is going to do, then there must be some element of physical reality in her particle that determines it'll do that. And if your theory doesn't describe that element of reality, your theory is not complete. Yes? That's the whole argument. That's the meat of the EPR argument. Uh, I'll just mention here, this is a criterion of reality, not a definition. That's important because a criterion gives you a sufficient condition for something, but not necessarily a necessary and sufficient condition, which is what a definition would do. That's just a side remark. Okay. So that's the thought. If you can predict with certainty what a system will do without in any way disturbing it, then there must be some element of reality in the system that determines it to act that way. And now we can apply the criterion, right? We say, look, Bob's experiment doesn't in any way disturb Alice's particle. Bob can now predict with certainty the outcome of Alice's, uh, uh, Alice's experiment. Therefore, there must be an element of reality in Alice's particle. <coughs> yes? And it's not represented in the quantum state. Um, I'm just repeating now what I said. So by the criterion, there must be this element of physical reality. And therefore, since it's not, in this, not represented in the singlet state, the singlet state is not complete. Answer, is quantum mechanical representa you know, representation of a system complete? Answer, no. Now, there is, a, there is um, given the singlet state, remember the singlet state, here's another point. Remember the singlet state, from it, I get a 50-50 prediction. 50% of the time, I'll get Alice up, Bob down, 50% of the time, the other way around. So if I run this experiment twice, and each time I prepare the particles in exactly the same quantum state, the first time I get this outcome, the second time I get that outcome, if they were exactly the same at the beginning, right? why did you get this outcome this time and that outcome that time? Right? That's what the completeness would tell you. Uh, and that, that just, the, the, if there's these elements of reality, of course, they must be different in the two cases. In the one case, I already prepared them this way and that way. And the quantum state is the same. So then you'd say the quantum description must be incomplete. Now, how can I escape from the argument? 
Well, one way to escape from the argument and keep the completeness is to say, well, no, actually, Bob doing his experiment does disturb Alice's particle, even though it's 100 billion billion miles away. It does it by a thing they call collapse of the wave function. And this collapse of the wave function is instantaneous and global. And as Einstein said, it's kind of telepathic and it's a spooky action at a distance. He said, come on, right? What are you talking about, Bohr, right? Einstein just thought that was ridiculous. This is just commonplace. Everybody says, take a dollar bill in half, tear it in, ha tear it in half, put one half in one envelope, one half in the other envelope, send one off to Alice, one off to Bob. When Alice opens her envelope, she knows what Bob's going to see when he opens his envelope. Big deal. They were prepared that way. Nothing spooky, nothing telepathic. But if you only tell me that much, it's an incomplete description. To completely describe the situation, you have to tell me which half went into which envelope at the beginning. Okay? So that, very quickly, is, is the EPR argument. It says the thing has to be incomplete or else you're stuck with spooky action at a distance. If it's, it's incomplete in, in that there are additional elements of reality that already determine what Alice will see and already determine what Bob will see. And when they're created, they're either created this way or that way. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.